Hi there, I'm Christian and as part of the team here at Freedom Church, it's great that you've decided to join us for our online teaching after we've had our summer break. Today we have Paul Carr speaking to us and he's entitled his talk, Building with Gold, Silver and Precious Stones. And this is actually the first, first part of a two-part series. But before we go over to him, let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we just thank you that we can come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you, Lord. We thank you that no matter what has happened this week, we can lay it aside and know that you are here, that you are meeting with us, that you will speak to us, Lord. So we just open up our eyes and our ears to you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now it's time to hear what the Lord has placed on Paul's heart. Hello. Uh, I've been chewing over this talk for quite some time now, and uh, I just want to, yeah, I just want to give it out this, right now to you. And uh, we're, because we're, I think we're in significant times here, not just in England, but the whole world. This is really significant times we're in. We live at such a time as this. Alice Petrie has been encouraging us. Uh, last term, he was encouraging us to watch what God is doing. And I think that's imperative that we do that at this time, that we watch what God is doing. But nothing of significant ever happens without prayer. And we have to pray. We, we have to have the Holy Spirit with us. The Holy Spirit has to be in us. And we have to be full of him to do the work that he is requiring us to do. Engaging in his presence and his power. He's such a gentleman, he always waits to be asked to come in. He never just bombards his way in. He waits to be asked. It doesn't matter what the circumstances, whether it's a, a great disaster or whether it's just a normal job or whether it's a great celebration. He waits to be asked all the time. And he loves to be, he loves to be asked to come in and help us. Jesus said in John 15, uh, you can, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and then Paul sort of really underlines that in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. How wonderful is that? Wonderful is that? We either live with him or without him. With him, all things. Without him, it equals nothing. Jesus Christ wants us to do all things. He really does. Not just uh, what we've seen him do in the past. We can't be bound to what he's done in the past. We cannot li limit ourselves to that. After all, his disciples did not. In fact, St. Paul didn't even meet Jesus when he walked on this earth. And so it's no different from you and I. We can do exactly what Paul is doing if we've got that calling on our life. Growing involves change and embracing the unfamiliar. And so it will be stretching. And the stretching can be quite painful, especially when we haven't used that particular muscle and, that, and, and faith is a muscle that we have to exercise and that we have to put it through its paces. We have to stretch it. Situations require that muscle of faith for us to use in a way that we haven't before. We'll require, we'll require more of him, that's Jesus Christ, in our lives. See, I'm doing a new thing. It's been worked into the Bible about 190 times we learned just last term. So please, let's start this time of teaching. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Let's start by inviting this Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit to come. Right at the start, as we assemble here in the Spirit to hear what God says to each one of us. Holy Spirit, welcome. You are welcome in this place. Please come. Please come, Holy Spirit, right now. Lord, you've, you've called me to give out this word. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would bring it to people in the way that it should come, Lord. Would you touch my words, Lord, to, and would you touch people's ears? Would you open their ears to hear? Would you open my mouth to speak what you want me to speak here today, right now, Lord? 
Because Lord, you want us to do all that Father God has empowered us to do. So we just ask your spirit to be with us. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I've got to run uh, two scriptures for today. The first one is 1 Corinthians 3, and it starts off at 6 and goes to verse 15. And this is Paul speaking in Corinthians. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has made it grow. So neither one who plants nor one who waters is anything, but only God makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labour. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundations as a wise builder, Paul says, and someone else is building upon it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If he's burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet he will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. And the second scripture I've got, and it's really been uh, uh, burning inside me for uh, a few weeks now, it's Psalm 127. Uh, this is a psalm of ascent. It was, it was uh, a psalm of ascent. That I think it's about 15 of them in the Bible. And it's as the uh, Israelites used to come into Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on a bit of a hill and they used to be singing their hearts out. And they used to sing these songs of ascent. As I say, there's about 15 of them. And because they're all going to a celebration. So it's an incredible time. It's three times in a year they were called to celebrate and they'll be rising up there. And Solomon wrote this one. And Psalm 127 starts off with, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Many part times in my life I've stayed up late, toiling for food, trying to make a living. And, and all in vain. I don't know if any of you are labouring in vain at the moment. I don't know. But God does. Sleep, yes, I've been deprived of sleep during this time of just working all the hours under the sun. And, because, and I've worried. I've really worried about the situations that I've faced. But do you see at the end of her, at verse 2 what uh, Paul, uh, Jesus uh, says here? He says he grants sleep to those he loves. And when that truth sort of delve into me, it really impacted me that because I, I really don't have a lot of problem with sleeping. I can go to sleep anywhere. And uh, there's a family joke that I once slept on a pile of stones with a stone under my head and just dropped off just like that. But, but sometimes it doesn't mean that I get a full night's sleep because he's got work for us to do. And sometimes he calls us, but he gives sleep to those he loves. And the sleep I have is sufficient to get me through the day. And, and did you notice that the sleep was a gift? He grants sleep to those he loves. And the first time I, I, I gave this talk out, I said, look to the, uh, the one of the guys on the front row. I said, look, here's the keys to the Ferrari over there. Uh, and, and if you don't take them, you, you've not got it, have you? You've not got it. You have to take the gift. You have to take the, It's the same as sleep. You have to take it. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you give me sleep because you love me. Amen. The Lord uh, is meant to watch over the city. If we're doing it, we will wear ourselves out because we're superseding our responsibility as we're carrying too much weight. And we can't do it. We can't do it. How can any possibly stay awake day and night? We have to make sure that the Lord is watching over our city, our home, our family life, our own life. Because, you know, this is what the city sort of means. It can mean we don't all live in big cities. It means for the small towns, it means for the communal families, etc., etc. If we concentrate on our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, he will warn us of any impending attack of the enemy. Now is the time to watch out. Look what God is doing and also look what he's saying. Sometimes we can believe that the enemy is attacking us. And that might be so. Uh, I think we've survived one or two attacks in our, in our walk with the Lord. But we must never lose sight. We must never lose sight of the one that lives inside us. We have the Holy Spirit living inside us. He is far more empowered than ever the enemy was, is. So can we just concentrate on being filled with the Holy Spirit and building an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? And sometimes we can uh, give the enemy too much credit and not concentrate on our own misdemeanors. What have we done wrong in this situation? God, what, where have we stepped out at this time? And, and, you know, then we need to come before the Holy God and put them right. It's so easy. It's so easy. He stands there waiting for us. I mean, if we ignore the red warning light on the car and it's flashing up and keeps coming up, if we ignore it, the car is going to stop. You'll be sure of that because something is desperately wrong. If it's an amber light, then we don't have to worry too much about it. It's best to seek advice very quickly. Like. But if it's red, we have to uh, stop. God wants to guard the city for us. He wants us to be protected. He wants to be our covering over us. He wants to build a hedge around us, the Bible says. He wants to be the watchman in our lives. At times, he nudges us where to build and what to build. He wants to build with us, and he wants us to build with him, more importantly. And I, and I just feel in this psalm that the city is a representation of our lives representation of our family life as well. We're all meant to live in families. In Psalm 68, 6, it says, God puts the lonely in families. And there can be a, many, a, vi, a, sorry, a great array of families. It can be a family of church. It can be a family of work. It can be a family, a legitimate, a legitimate family, if that's the right word for it. But one of the, well, I know he's the best, he's one of the church family, to be a member of a church and be in that family. 1 Corinthians says, we are workers together with God and that within the church is where we can work. That's where we can work. And really just in one, that 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it speaks to me as a team. God calls us to work together. He he, 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 he just wants us to be in his team because we, we can't do it by ourselves. He wants to walk alongside each of us. As Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. How, you know, that's, we can look to that if we, if we do one of the jobs around. We can look for the increase and we can know that's accredited to our account. God wants to work in partnership with us. And it started at the very beginning. Uh, God created the animals, yes, in Genesis. And who named them? It was Adam that named them. Um, what shall I call this one? Oh, no, a kangaroo. Crazy name, crazy name. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labour in vain. And do you know what I think? I think sometimes we continue to labour in vain. We can think, 
we can do it. We can do it. And actually we can't. We can't. We haven't asked uh, God what he wants us to do. We just go off and do what we want. And we continue down that path while God waits patiently until we come to a realisation that he's actually not in it. And we turn to him yelling for that quick prayer, help. And he comes to us and rescues us and we have to get back on the right path with him. I, I remember a holiday that we once took. We were fortunate my father gave us a gift of uh, money. And, and, and that was at the time, and we still can actually, we can make a small amount of money go an awful long way. And we, we had great fun. We, we suddenly thought, yes, we can go and book up a holiday. And we did. We booked up a holiday and there are, we chose the place to go and everything like that. And there was one thing that was quite, completely different about this. You see, we didn't have to ask God for the money. Every other holiday that we've had, and we've had marvellous holidays, We've had to ask for everything, the money, the car, the, the food, where to stay, absolutely everything. was. It was imperative that we pray to God, otherwise we wouldn't be able to go. And we went on this holiday. It was a lovely place, nothing wrong with the weather, nothing wrong with it. But you know what? It just wasn't the same. There was something that was missing. We didn't have that same level of joy of knowing that he was right beside him. I'm, I'm not saying we went without him. We didn't. We did pray and uh, he, he was there. But, you know, it was, it was a bit like the, 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 uh, they describe it as being brass, don't they? The, the, the sky being as brass and our prayers just weren't being heard. We didn't have that same close relationship on that holiday. Yes, we had a holiday. We noticed the difference, the one we took, because we could. The ones we've had to pray for our provision for. Uh, um, and uh, uh, it's like labouring in vain. We'd laboured in vain. It wasn't the same. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labour in vain. He wants to build every single part of our life. He wants to build it all into our life. He can so easily wear us out. Uh, uh, life can, can it? Life can so easily wear us out because everything that we want to build it involves a struggle. Uh, we could call it a battle, if you like. I mean, business is a battle. Children are sometimes a battle. Marriage is a battle where two people have to get on. We have to work at that relationship for a, all the time. Everything in life we have to work for is a battle. Uh, is a battle. And it's so easy to wear us out with stress, depression or burnout. When that's not God's plan for our lives. It's not his plan for our lives. He gives sleep to his beloved. He gives sleep to his beloved. To be beloved, you have to build a relationship with him, a strong relationship. You have to not want to do anything, even going on holiday without him. Luke talks about the lady who washed the feet of Jesus and the other guests complained about her, didn't they? But Jesus said, leave her alone. So you see, she did what she could. She washed his feet. She washed his feet with her tears, dried them with, his, with her hair and then poured this incredible perfume on them. And that's what we're responsible for doing. We're responsible for doing what we can where we can. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 3.12. He gives a list of items that we can build with. He starts off with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. And, and it's, it's in that sort of list of six things, Paul doesn't draw a line in the middle, but I'm going to draw a line in the middle. Because Paul says that everything that we do is going to be tested by fire, whether it's with gold or whether it's with straw. It's going to be tested with fire. God's refining fire. And you know as well as I do that wood, hay and grass just goes to ash, doesn't it? It goes to ash. But actually, gold and silver need to be refined. 
they need to be refined. And precious stones don't really get harmed in a fire. They don't. So the question is, what have you built with? What are you building your life with? What are you building it with? And what, at the end of the time, what will happen to your work? Today, I just want to go through um, the first three, really. I want to talk about gold, silver and precious stones. Because why do we want to spend time on something that won't last? Why do we want to spend time when we get there? To get to heaven and we're all going to get there if we believe in Jesus Christ and ask him into our lives. We're going to go to heaven. The eternity starts in, in our lives right now as soon as we accept him. And, and yet, you know, we don't want to go before him and stand before him and just see everything that we've done just burned up. The Lord wants it to last to, yeah, to an eternity. But so can I encourage you to build with gold, silver and precious stones? You see these three go through the fire. And I just, I'll ex can, I, can I just take a few minutes to, to explain them to you? Because this, uh, uh, as I was working through this, this was quite a revelation to me. Go, what, what does gold mean? What does gold mean? What does gold stand for? In, in gold can stand for negative and positive. Here, Paul uses it in a very, very positive sense. Apostle Paul is saying that all Christians will be tested when they leave this world. Their works or what kind of ministry they did while here will go through the fire. If it's weak, it's like wood, hay and straw. It will not endure. It will just turn to ash. If it's gold, however, it will stand the test of fire will endure. It was work that it, uh, was, has eternal meaning. God's refining fire. That means to be made better. Revelation 3.18 says, Jesus speaking, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, salve to put on your eyes so you can see, not destroyed. That's what we need to build with. We need to build gold. Gold is motivation, a pure love for Jesus Christ. He's our rock. We need dependence on him. We need that intimate relationship with him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So it comes question time. What are you doing for the glory of God? 1 Peter uh, 1 7 says, Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. That's 1 Peter uh, from the message. We must have Christ at the centre of everything we do in all things, whether it be just doing the washing up, whether it be driving to work. Whatever it is, we need to have Jesus Christ at the centre. So easily, sometimes I think uh, we can get caught up in the Martha trap. This Martha trap is you serve to be noticed. Look at me. I'm here. I'm doing the talk in front of the camera. She went up to, see, to Jesus and said, why don't you tell my sister to come down here? Come and help me. Help me do the cooking. And Jesus returned to her and said, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. One thing is needed. One thing is needed. It's Jesus Christ. So simple. And that's Luke out of 1041. Or in other words, stop what you're doing. Come and sit with Mary. Enjoy the time with Christ. And that's what church is meant to be, a time where we come together to enjoy being together, to enjoy being in the presence of God. When two or more gathered, he is there. And, you know, in great gatherings, it is very powerful. I think the word holiday comes from holy days. 
we would not have a holiday if it wasn't for God. And we've just had our summer camp. We had a holiday for four days. Absolutely incredible. God and, I, and God is into celebration. God is into celebrating big times. I mean, the, the first time that Jesus did the miracle was at, at the wedding, wasn't it? Turning all that water into wine. God is into celebration. And back, way back in the Old Testament, uh, in Exodus, uh, God said, I want you to have seven feasts every year. Every year, get together as a family, have a ginormous feast. And then, not only that, I want you to go and I want you to visit Jerusalem three times a year for at least a week. At least a week. Absolutely incredible. God's into celebration. He really is. And, and can you imagine it, what these uh, Israelites had to do? They had to stop their work. Whatever their work was, they had to stop it. Stop plowing the fields, stop cutting the corn, whatever it was. It all had to be done. They'd, they'd have to leave, if you like, servants to feed the sheep or something like that. And then they were to travel from wherever they lived and go to Jerusalem. And that's why. And they were celebrating that they could do this. They were celebrating that they come together. Sometimes it's reported that over a million people came into the town of Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem at this time. And not only did they have to stop work, which meant if you stop work in those days, you no money, no money would come in. They had to take an offering with them. They had to either carry the lamb or the, or the cow, or they have to go and buy one when they're there to make an offering to the Lord. They were never to come to, to empty handed, but they did it with great fun and great excitement. It was such a time, a holy day. He was saying, come and gather, come and be with me, come and give. And you know what? God thought it was a good idea. Isn't that wonderful? A nation, a people, a church. God wants to be at the centre of all that we do. So what's your motivation in life? If it's business? I mean, business is okay. Okay. In, 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 but a business has to make money. It has to make money. But for what? What are you going to do when you've made all that money? What do you do with it? I mean, how much do you need? And don't get sucked, in, sucked into the world's trap and become something like an oligarch, you know? So where are you going to make the, where are you going to invest your money if you're in business or if you're at work? Where are you going to invest your money? God expects us and really our praise and hopes that we would invest it in his kingdom, in the building his kingdom. He wants you to help build his kingdom. He'll give you all the opportunities you need to make the money. It's quite surprising how he works. He'll open doors you thought would never open. The kingdom is there for you to serve. The joy of giving to the Lord and making a difference in people's lives. Never was that so empowering at the moment. So much needed at the moment. And yeah, honestly, we could do so much more with more financial support. We could plow it back into his kingdom. And we are restricted in what we do. There's much more that we can do, and there's much more we would love to do. Deuteronomy 8 says, he gives you power to get wealth. God gave each one of us our abilities. He gave it. We've each got a calling, each of us. Every single human being on this earth has got a calling from God, whether they accept it or not. But what is the motivation that drives us? Is it for his glory? Or do we want to be noticed like Mary did, Martha did? Or if we're honest, are, are some of our motives a little bit selfish? Are they for our own enjoyment or our own comfort? Are we building our kingdom or his kingdom? Are we prepared to go without some 
luxuries in order to build God's kingdom. It is, a, it is, is our experience that as we've ploughed into God's kingdom, he's, he's not given us so much more um, money, but he's given us so much more contentment, so much more deepness with inside us. Does that make sense? He's, he's, he's returned it back in love and, and, and relationships so many times. And we're thankful. We acknowledge that all the fun that we've had and we have for, is from him. He causes us to have this great fun. And I know we're, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Uh, but his, his word still stands in Malachi. It's very blunt and very factual. Malachi 3, 8 and 12. All that we have is from him. He asks that we acknowledge that by our action. Giving him the first fruits. Not what's left over. So let's do it joyfully. Why not do it joyfully? Can I encourage you to build with God? Build something great. Build something that builds his kingdom. Build with God. And what's the material you're building with? I heard this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, this uh, preacher, um, he says, people keep coming up to me uh, sometimes and they ask, what is God's plan for my life? And he turns around to them very thoughtfully and says, that sentence is three words too long. Interesting. Who's at the centre of that question they're asking? Is it me? Is it my? I think this is a this is a pivotal time we're, we're living in at the moment. What changes do we have to make in our lives? And that includes me. What changes do we have to make to make sure that we're building this firm foundation, that we're building with gold, that we're building with gold. Remember the Mary and Martha story, as I said earlier, Martha said it was Mary's fault. It's somebody else's fault. And Jesus said, no, Mary, it's not Mary. Mary's doing the right thing. It's, it's you, it's you. We always have to look at ourselves. Painful it might be. But we have to look at ourselves. And I believe we're in the time where we need to make changes. It starts with a decision. And it needs Jesus Christ to help us to follow it through in that decision. What is God's plan? It is to build with gold. Jesus Christ. I love the, the mercy seat uh, in the Old Testament. While I was doing this research on gold, the mercy seat was covered in gold. Does God want to sit down? I don't think so. But he built it as a symbol for us. It's covered in gold. No matter where you've been or what you've done, now is the time, I believe. Now is the time to build with God. Joyful motivation of love towards Jesus, overflowing into every area of our lives. By investing in building God's kingdom is the best investment you could ever make. It will be with gold, which will not get burnt up in the fire. <coughs> Silver. Silver in the Bible is all about redemption. The priests... In, in, in Exodus, in the book of Numbers, it was uh, 350 in Numbers. They were redeemed with a shekel of silver. They had to redeem their ministry with a shekel of silver. They had to pay a shekel of silver to Aaron. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Actually, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Silver equals redemption. It means the action of saving or being saved from sin, evil, etc. It's redemption. It's lovely, great to have done a, a little research. I encourage you to have a look at what silver means in the Bible. But the question here is, am I, am I building redemptively? 
Am I building redemptively? Am I helping people's relationships becoming reconciled? Whether it's the relationship between man and God, or whether it's a relationship with husband and wife, whether it's a work colleague's relationships, whether it's a friend's relationship with another friend. Is redemption working in what I say and how I encourage people around me? Am I helping people work through life? There are so many. We get ourselves into so many pickles, don't we? So many pickles. But am I helping the relationships around me? Are you trying to find a solution that brings about forgiveness and restoration to those you know, which is the only forgiveness and restoration can only come through Jesus Christ. We know that. Am I bringing Christ's love to people, bringing hope, building bridges, and having no part of slander or gossip? Or am I airing offensive, dividing instead of reconciling? Maybe I know where I would like to be, but I know how it really is. And so I want to work to get where I want to be. Buying back, that's what redemption means. This is a time we, when we can do it. With Christ's heart in the power and the Holy Spirit, we can make a difference. And I mean, he comes back to this incredible prayer of Francis of Assisi, doesn't it? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow so love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, may we bring joy. So silver means uh, re represents redemption. Gold represents building on Christ, a firm foundation. Precious stones. What does precious stones mean here? Precious stones we need to build with precious stones. They're not physical stones. I don't mean. To, I think. Don't think we've got to go and dig up all the stones in the book in the garden and make a wall out of them and things like that. The Book of Exodus, Aaron had an outfit made with so much meaning in it. One item he had to wear before he could go into the presence of God was the ephod. The ephod he used to come over his chest and over his back. And there'll be six precious stones on the front and six precious stones on the back. And uh, they, those, each one of those stones would represent a tribe, a family, a family of God. 12 tribes of Israel. Precious stones represents people here. It's to build for the glory of God. Build redemptively. Build with people. Matthew 6, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. So here it goes. It's sort of building and battling. I've talked about here at the, in this first part of this psalm, isn't it? This psalm 127. You cannot be a part of a church and not enter a battle. If you're in a church, you are in a battle. I can also say it's extremely hard. And, and now I'm thinking I'm going to change that. It's not extremely hard. It's impossible to build by ourselves. We need to be involved. We need to be with a team of people. We need to be there. You have to be part of the church. Build with people. Invest your life in people. Serving in a church. Because, you know, we won't be able to go before God and say, look at my house. Oh, look at the business I built, Lord. I'm worth millions. We won't be able to go before him and say that. I mean, we'll, we'll leave all that behind. All that stays here. And that's not the inheritance he's talking about when he asks us to leave an inheritance for our children. The inheritance that we have to leave for our children 
is him. We have to leave him. We have to make sure that we planted him into children's lives when we go. Just as the people did before us. How do you invest in people? Whatever you do for them, you must bring them closer to Jesus. It must be. That's building with gold, silver and precious stones. This corporate is together. It's something we have to do jointly. We can't do it alone. We can't do it. We need everybody to help us. Those that come to church, those that support us, those that pray for us, those that walk alongside us, those that water for us, those that plant for us and we water for them, etc., etc. Building to the glory of God, working redemptively with the place, with the place and, and what God had got before, where he's put us, each one of us, building with people. Wherever God has placed us, that's our field, isn't it? Wherever God's put us, that's our field. That's where we start to build. They're the ones that we've been asked to introduce to Jesus. And we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Ephesians 4 uh, starts off at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Incredible, incredible words. 2 Corinthians 10 talks about a spiritual battle, talks about weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Mighty in God. It's not a gun or a sword. They are spiritual weapons God's given us. Ephesians 6 talks about the sword being the word and it being a double-edged sword. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he, he was in the First World War and the Second World War. He was a special unit in the Second World War, actually stationed here in, in, in England. And he had a commando dagger. And, and it's, it was double-edged. You didn't, you didn't have to hold it up one way to cut a tomato with it. You could cut it either, either, either turn it upside down and still cut that tomato. It's a double-edged sword, sword. And that's what God says his word is. In other words, if it's going into you right now, it's going into me as well. What I'm saying here is cutting me as much as it cuts you. It's a double-edged sword. The word of God is powerful. It's a double-edged sword, has two cutting edges. We have to apply the word of God. Truth builds upon truth. I love it the way God builds through his Bible. Truth upon truth. God will confirm more through his word to each of us. Every time God speaks, he speaks with power and authority. There is still power and authority in his words today. Power for healing, power for deliverance because of the truth. It liberates people's lives. The sword of the Spirit is what God wants to put in our mouths. But if you don't read your Bible, you won't know how powerful this word is. It's got to be in you to come out of us. There'll be no cutting edge in what we say. Psalm 27, 127. 127, build with God, it's the only way. Can I just read the, uh, how the message interprets uh, this psalm that I've read out to you this so, so far this week? And the message starts off, if God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night watchman might as well nap. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. 
do you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? I'm just going to quickly pray right now and just allow the Holy Spirit to come. I've said an awful lot here. And this is just the first half of Psalm 127. Next week I'll be going right through. I'll be just continuing on in Psalm 127. But just let's pray. Stop here right now. Let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, would you just come? Would you speak to your people, Lord? Speak to your people. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.